Uh, this sermon fits in the uh, Testimony in Stone series. We have been playing off the chapel in terms of its testimony, what was built in here as an expression of our faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And today's is on the four Gospels. If you notice that these four columns that hold up the dome, Penedentives is the structural kite-like shape on which the emblems of the Gospel are imprinted in stone. And the four living creatures from Ezekiel and the four living creatures from Revelation were the inspiration behind the emblems. That being Matthew, the winged man, underscoring the humanity of Christ. And here we have uh, Mark, underscoring the royalty and strength, the lion. And then the ox, emblematic of the sacrifice that Christ gave. And then the eagle, representative of the Gospel of John, the divinity of Christ. So what we want to do in the next 20, 30 minutes or so is imagine a dialogue with the evangelists, the Gospel writers. What would it be like to hear them discuss the work they put into writing their Gospel? Discussing the creative process, the experience of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, reflecting on the purpose and the intended audience. As you know, each writer takes a slant on the life of Christ and the works of Christ. And then they weave that perspective into a gospel account, a narrative that is, I think, both revealing and compelling. So we have Levi, the former tax man, otherwise known as Matthew. Give a wave so they know who Matthew is, Typhoon. <laughs> and we have John Mark, Peter's junior colleague, followed by Dr. Luke, the Apostle Paul's co-worker, and finally the venerable and beloved John, the Apostle, the son of Zebedee. You know, we know nothing about their appearances. I think that's striking because you'd never get away with anything in the 21st century without beginning first with how people look. But we know nothing of how the evangelist looked. But I think we can venture a guess about their personalities from their writing styles. Matthew shapes his teaching, structures it in such a way as to really bring out a discipleship curriculum. His pedagogical pace is methodical and structured a lot more than, let's say, Mark, but not, by no means dull or boring. There is an urgency in Mark's tone. He's the most restless of the four. You'd almost think that he was about to get married. <laughs> His well-chosen words are free of any extraneous dialogue. You can't read Mark without getting a sense of the immediacy of Jesus' words and actions. Of the three, Luke pays the most careful attention to the people dynamic, to women, to strangers, to outcasts. In addition to Luke's concern for historical accuracy, he offers a keen psychological insight into Jesus' interaction with all kinds of people. John is the group's poet, prophet, pastor. He impresses us as maybe the deepest thinker, who creatively works the, the images and the metaphors and the encounters of the life of Jesus into worship. John exudes a passion for Christ. Really, they all do. The Gospel writers are not novelists writing a creative story. They're not journalists dispassionately conveying facts. They're not scientists discovering data. They're evangelists witnessing to the truth, the truth that is in Jesus. And we exegete them because they exegeted the life of Jesus. The law required confirmation by two witnesses, 
Well, the Gospels confirm the truth twice over. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the north, south, east, and west of the Gospel. No two people ever tell the same story the same way, let alone four. But these four evangelists agree. So I think we can think of you as the, the bass, the tenor, the alto, and the soprano of the gospel song. So let's begin. What is your advice on how we should read your gospels? Let's begin with you, Matthew. Thank you. The four uh, different and diverse accounts of our gospel is truly a blessing, a beautiful blessing. Uh, I think people get it wrong when they try to harmonize everything. Um, we uh, come from diverse backgrounds, as you would expect. So we uh, frame the narrative of Jesus in our own unique way, and I think this is a very good thing. The, our differences, our purpose, even our approach, uh, although it's different, it makes for one lively witness. Um, and I think that we will explore some of these differences in this interview. Mark, what's your take? How should we read your gospel? Yeah, yeah, I agree. All four gospels are unique. Each one has its own purpose or calling. So we don't want to put them into a blender and uh, smooth everything out. Neither do we want to put on blinders and ignore the differences. If I add some details that, uh, say, my brother Matthew leaves out, I expect those details to be acknowledged. We may be framing the story distinctively, but we need to pay attention to the other accounts. All I'm saying is, is the church has been given four Gospels, and she needs all four of them. Luke? I think it's important to remember what John wrote at the end of your Gospel, that, that the world's not big enough to hold everything that could be said about Jesus, because you know, it comes to Jesus, it's infinite truth on our very finite scale. So we have to be selected, and we have to be diverse, and we don't have everything that, that could be said, but what we do have, we're supposed to have. And um, I wrote in my own introduction that many have undertaken it to write an account of the life of Christ, but through a long process, the Spirit has chosen these four, our four, to be unique and authoritative witnesses to his life and ministry. So. As you read mine, um, I think you can tell that I paid careful attention to my sources, uh, whether it's members of Jesus' own family or the other apostles or people just like myself um, who had their lives completely changed and turned upside down by him. John? Yeah, I like to think um, that the Gospels read us more than we read the Gospels. And so when we study the text, as important as that is, I think it's important to see that the text is really studying us. So when we read the encounters between uh, Nicodemus and Jesus or between the woman and the well at Jesus, we see ourselves in the story. We're in the story with them, and we can ask ourselves the questions, are we admirers? Or are we um, followers? Are we just simply you know, looking at him from the side, or are we really true disciples? Um, I think being examined by the Gospels is something that's very important. And, you know, as Gospel writers, we're telling the story with energy and creativity and freedom. And I think that comes out. You see why I said John was the deep thinker? <laughs> why did you begin the way, why did you begin the Gospel the way you did? And let's start with Mark here on this one. I felt that we needed a concise narrative that got straight to the point of the life of Jesus. I started with, with John the Baptist and Jesus, and I, admittedly I used as few words as possible to cover Jesus' baptism and his temptation in the wilderness. And before you know it, Jesus is into his mission. He's calling his disciples, and, and just like that, we're headed to the cross. Now, that, that's probably why some have referred to my gospel as this passion narrative with an introduction. Uh, I think that's a bit of an overstatement, but the movement to the cross is from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Matthew, why did you begin the way you did? I'm probably the most Jewish of the four of us. I begin with Abraham, as you would know. <laughs> uh, then the three sets of the 14, 14 generations, which culminate in the birth of Jesus Christ. 
son of Joseph, son of David, son of Abraham. I thought it was very important to strike a balance in my narrative to capture the clarity of uh, Mark's gospel, but also to include the complexity and the sense of fulfillment that Jesus is coming uh, conveys. So I'm thinking that, uh, that we have a deeper appreciation of what I'm trying to communicate to my audience. Luke? Um, I wanted to explore the relational aspect of Jesus' life and ministry, so as a Gentile, I wanted to know the stories behind the story as well, too, which is why you see the stories of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary at the very beginning to show that, that salvation history has been happening even before Christ has been born. And that's also why, in his genealogy, I do trace him back to the son of Abraham as the fulfillment of Jewish history, but he's also the son of Adam and the fulfillment of my, my history, all of salvation history is being found and brought to a climax in Jesus in this one life. John? Yeah, in my prologue, I'm, I'm trying to weave together the beginning of creation with the beginning of Jesus' ministry and to show the connection that's there, and they're, they're inseparable. Um, so when I write, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and showing that connected to, and there was a man who was sent from God whose name was John, and the connection that's there, uh, they're inseparable. So time and eternity really on this side, they boldly are bearing witness to light coming into the world, the true light, and we can't get behind it because it's been there from before the beginning of creation, and neither can we evade it or escape it because it's permeating, it's saturating all of our story. Uh, but when I wrote, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, uh, some people think this is metaphysical or mystical. It's actually really quite down to earth. It's pivotal. It's decisive for all of human destiny. So this theme of creation is running through my gospel. Um, and the very Word that spoke creation in the beginning is the Word that's introduced by the Word of the prophet John. What do you mean when you say that you, the theme of creation runs through your whole gospel? Yeah, it's, it's embedded in the text. It's implicit in what I've written. Um, but take the first week of creation, for example, and the first week of Jesus' ministry. In creation, we see the Spirit of God hovering over the water. And then in Jesus' first week of ministry, we see the Spirit of God descending upon God's chosen one. In creation, we see God calling into existence all things through creation and his act of creation. And in Jesus' ministry, we see him calling his disciples to follow him. Uh, we also see at the end of creation week, it climaxes in the creation of Adam and Eve and the marriage and the, the connection between them. And the end of Jesus' first week of ministry climaxes in the wedding feast at Cana. So everything that Jesus was doing, whether he was clearing out the temple and prophesying about his resurrection, um, whether he was discussing the new birth with Nicodemus or he was offering living water to the woman at the well, uh, it's all pointing to him being the living word that came down to earth. Why do you suppose sincere Bible readers miss the structure of the Gospels? I mean, I think we often think that the first three are a lot alike, and John's a little different, but really each one of them has a distinctive structure. Matthew, you want to? Yes. Uh, as needful and noble as it is, I blame a lot of this on our devotional reading, and some even on the way how, the, how preachers preach. I think when we have a tendency to focus on a few select verses, we miss the context and the thrust of the text. In this way, we sort of uh, miss the forest for the trees, if you will. Matthew, does your gospel have a discernible structure? Certainly. Uh, I group the teachings of Jesus in five blocks, uh, each block ending with the transitional phrase, after Jesus had made an end of these sayings. The first block of teaching material is the Sermon on the Mount. 
It's followed by the Sermon on Missions and the Sermon on Parables. The Sermon on Community follows the Transfiguration, and the Sermon on the End follows Jesus' very bold uh, confrontation and condemnation of the religious leaders. Uh, in this way, it's my hope and prayer that the reader will get a grasp on Jesus' disciple-shaping curriculum. Mm -hmm. Luke, what kind of structure in your gospel? Well, since I'm exploring the relational aspect of Christ's life, um, I decided to structure it with seven different meals, beginning with the great banquet hosted by Matthew, and then the last meal being the Last Supper with his disciples, just to show that all throughout his life and ministry, Jesus did ministry and teaching at the table, and you see holiness and hospitality just colliding together with him in his life. And that's something that I resonate with, and I wanted to show as disciples, we need spiritual direction and teaching with hospitality and with table fellowship with one another. Mark, how about you? You know, I offer this rapid fire series of events that take place outside of Jerusalem. Uh, the pivotal point of which is at Caesarea Philippi with, with Peter's confession and uh, his rebuke followed by the transfiguration of Jesus. The fullness of that moment, the magnitude of, of that moment, the transfiguration, is so difficult to comprehend. The disciples struggled with this, and I wanted to convey their struggle in my gospel because, you know, if we're truly following after Jesus, we face that same struggle today. Today's preachers seem to ask us to believe in so little. They want believing to be as convenient and as easy as possible. But the four of you seem to insist on making believing in Jesus kind of difficult. Mm. Why? Mark, let me begin with you. Uh, listen, the call to discipleship is no easier to accept than Jesus casting out evil spirits. Uh, invitation and, and exorcism are side by side in the gospel, and we've got to accept that. Jesus didn't come to smooth things out for us psychologically. He came to save us from eternal destruction. Matthew, can you speak to that? Yes, I can. Um, I think we all agree that Jesus is not some symbol to be colored in by our own preferences and ideals. Uh, I think we all do a wonderful job in uh, conveying the high cost of discipleship. Um, our Christologies, I believe, all agree, but we come at the truth from slightly different angles. Luke? I think there's a tendency today for some Christians to see Jesus and Paul at a tension, at a conflict, almost as though we need Paul and the epistles to explain Jesus and the Gospels. And I, I don't think that's true. Um, but I if you believe that, you might look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, and you see Jesus' last words of, now, now go, go and do likewise. You might look at that and say, well, you know, there's no way I can be that kind of good neighbor to everyone I meet because, you know, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of grace. I can't do it. And well, absolutely, we are all sinners in need of grace. All four of us will testify to that. Um, but that's kind of the point. The point is that it's Jesus' grace flowing through us that allows us to be this kind of good neighbor. And if Jesus was willing to risk everything and give everything for us as disciples, we live that same life. And the question isn't, who is my neighbor in that parable? The real question is, Am I willing to be that kind of good neighbor and that good Samaritan to everyone I meet because I'm a sinner saved by grace and Christ's grace flows out from me to everyone that I see? Well said, John. Now, yeah, if we pay attention, Jesus is always leading us deeper into the reality of what it means to belong to him and to follow him. A pivotal moment for me was in the feeding of the more than 5,000 we see Jesus' compassion for the crowd, and he's reaching out to them and taking care of their needs. But then he pushes them and pushes it beyond our comfort zone. Um, I mean, if we think that evangelism is just some kind of popularity contest, you know, we can forget about that. When he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, oh, I mean, we should know that this isn't just some kind of 
spiritual hobby. Discipleship is so much more. Mm -hmm. Would you, the four of you, summarize your take on how Jesus came across to people? And Mark, can we begin with you again? You know, Jesus, Jesus isn't as nice as a lot of people make him out to be. <laughs> He's not some cardboard saint, not some polite churchman. Jesus could be stern and forceful with the evil spirits <laughs> and stern and forceful with the disciples. Stubborn hearts ticked him off. When anger was called for, he could be angry, but he never lost his cool. It was amazing. Even when he was driving out the money changers from the temple and preaching his sermon of woes against the religious leaders, Jesus was in complete control of himself. There's this uh, passionate seriousness about Jesus. So I, I don't think that most folks imagine him as some happy-go-lucky fella. I don't. Luke, how did Jesus come across to people? I agree. Uh, nice isn't quite the right word for him. Uh, but love is, and not the cheap kind, not the sentimental kind, but the deep, bold, selfless kind of love. That sums him up perfectly to me. Um, I think in my own story, I, I know that his love is big enough to just conquer walls of hostility that I had against the Jews, and I've seen him do the same thing for countless other people, whether it's anger and resentment between male and female, rich and poor, slave or free, it doesn't matter. His love is big enough to, to conquer that all. And at the same time, his life was like, a, like an open invitation that anyone who wanted to come could come. But if you came, you were never the same again because everything he did would be to discourage admirers but to draw in followers. So deep love and an open invitation. Matthew? Jesus truly is the master teacher. And when you were with him, you expected to be taught. He was always teaching, we were always learning. He didn't need a special occasion or context or even a special platform to teach. He taught from a mountainside of the shores of Galilee. Uh, sometime even as we were walking along the path, he's always teaching. In this way, he used uh, earthy metaphors, down-to-earth parables to convey his message. Form followed function beautifully. People never worked hard to really grasp the message he was trying to convey. I also think we all do a, a great job in explaining how accessible Jesus truly was. Whether you were a child or a Roman soldier or a poor sick woman who wanted to see Jesus, he was always accessible. And I think we really do a wonderful job in conveying his accessibility. John? Yeah, Jesus made believers out of us. Uh, <laughs> uh, my purpose for writing, even as I said and we read earlier this morning, was that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And we saw this happen time and time again, uh, whether it was with Jesus and Nicodemus uh, that he was working there. And it's not just some kind of... Uh, formula, ABC formula for conversion. Uh, he's invariably touching the very core of who the person is, and it's not always easy. Uh, we see it with the woman at the well, and I mean, look at my life. He changed who I am. Did the truth of the incarnation come from Jesus himself? You know, there's been a lot of skepticism about that as if that was written in later. If you'd speak to that, Mark, can we begin with you. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. This is our confession and our witness. It's not like we've embellished the story of Jesus after the fact in order to win some following for ourselves. That's ridiculous. Matthew's a tax collector, not a novelist. John's a fisherman, not a novelist. Luke's a doctor, not a novelist. We're witnesses, not novelists. My gospel begins with the voice from heaven saying at Jesus' baptism, you are my son whom I love. 
With you I am well pleased. And it ends with the Roman centurion saying at the cross, surely this man was a son of God. And everything in between substantiates the testimony that Jesus is the Son of Man, the Lord of the Sabbath, the Messiah, and the Son of God, all in ways that are true to Jesus himself. Matthew. Well, certainly Jesus is not what we Jews expected. That's why I think it's very important that we underscore the precise ways in which Jesus fulfills the Old Testament uh, prophecy. Uh, Jesus says himself that no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus centers salvation in himself. Mm -hmm. And with that uh, being said, I think that uh, we can truly confess that he is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Luke. Yeah, I mean, he's the climax of salvation history. It's, it's the truth that we've been given to tell. And the truth is right there in Mary's song and in Simeon's prophecy that he is the light of revelation for the Gentiles, and he's the glory of Israel. And he said it himself, and he said the truth when he said in that synagogue in Nazareth that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor because he's the new wine and the new wineskins. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's the Messiah. He's the long-expected bridegroom. And on top of all of that, he's the God who will sit down with the sinners and have a meal with them. So I don't think glory gets any more personal than that. And everything that he did, he embodied and breathed and lived out incarnation for all of us to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. John? Yeah, the identity of Jesus is at the heart of every encounter, every act that's in the gospel. And I think it's fitting that within the canon of Scripture, um, my gospel comes at the end as I'm able to build on and to draw out some new things from what these guys have written. Um, but you know, you talked about skepticism earlier, and I, I insist that the accounts of seven signs and uh, the seven sayings, those are based in my eyewitness real experience of Jesus. I heard him say to Martha, and I heard him say, um, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though he die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Well, one last question. People seem to have a favorite gospel. Sometimes that favorite gospel changes at different stages of our <laughs> Christian life. Do you have a favorite reader? Mark? Hmm. You know, my gospel's been characterized as, uh, let me see if I get this right, a tagline gospel. <laughs> I think that's because I, I like to summarize a scene or some discourse in a single line or, or sentence. The word pictures that I use about Jesus, they're straightforward. They're, they're unembellished. Um, I like to take a cue from the prophets and boil my message down to the basics. Now, because I use such ordinary language and unadorned style, uh, because I tell my stories with as few extra details as possible, uh, I'd say that I qualify as a minimalist. But my goal is to draw the maximum amount of attention to, Je attention to Jesus. My gospel connects with, with readers who bring their imaginations to the process of, of understanding Jesus. They, they sense the energy and the tension, uh, the passion that's in Jesus' life. Matthew? I want the kind of reader that uh, Mark wants as well, uh, but maybe with my approach, I would advise the reader to slow down a bit, to study the teachings of Jesus, uh, because I believe that if we are to respect the spirit-inspired work of this text, that we must enter into the pedagogical style and structure of each gospel writer. Um, now, this will demand something more than most readers and even some preachers are willing to give, but I think in order to grasp a deeper appreciation of the gospel narrative, this is the approach we must take. We are convinced that the Holy Spirit is involved in every aspect of this work, 
And if we are to appreciate that dynamic, this is an approach, a more studious approach that I believe we must take. Very good. Lou? I think I'd want the reader to uh, maybe not segment it so much as we often want to do, but to read it straightforward from beginning to end. And as you do that, allow for the differences between the Gospels and, and appreciate those and realizing that at some point in your life, one of our Gospels will speak to you in a really special, specific way, or one of the ways that we tell a parable or a story, and uh, through the Spirit, that, that's meant for you. And so appreciate that and enjoy that. And um, since I do want to focus on the relational aspect of Jesus, I think you can find yourself in the story. You can find yourself in these conversations, in these parables, in these encounters. And then go, after reading that, live out the salvation history that we're a part, part of today. John? Yeah, I think, you know, reading our Gospels, the purpose is to believe in Jesus, and the question is, are we believing when we read them? Whether you have a favorite or not, I think it comes down to are we truly believing what we're reading? And I think it's important to note that believing isn't separated from, um, you know, our foot to the path discipleship. It's not separated from a living out of Jesus' kingdom ethic. It's not separate from uh, a relational transformation that takes place in our communities. It's not separate from transformation that takes place in our own hearts. Believing means all of that. It's all of it. It's believing that is worshipful, not just worship, but worshipful, true my Lord and my God worship. It's believing that really captures the essence of who Christ is and demands all of our attention and respect. It means that Christ is worthy of all our trust, believing that Jesus is Lord. Well, we're almost out of time. We're definitely out of script. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for bringing a fresh perspective to the Gospels. Matthew, through you we hear Jesus say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is gentle, I'm humble. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Mark, you lead us to the Son of Man who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. And Luke, we're with you on those uh, disciple-bound, uh, Emmaus-bound disciples, that were not our hearts burning within us as he talked to us along the way, as he opened the scriptures to us. And John, I think you nail it at the kind of pivot point in your gospel when you quote Peter. Lord, where else do we have to go? Mm -hmm. You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. So, amen. Amen. And thank amen. you. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, author of Revelation, the one who speaks to us daily from your word that enlivens us, gives us life, eternal, physical, spiritual, in every which way, lead us to the truth. Help us to embrace your word in the Spirit, that we might grow and deepen and enjoy you more. I thank you, Lord, for this time together in your word. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray in thanksgiving together. Amen. Amen. Amen.